Great to be with you again this evening. I'll tell you the truth, I'm not used to seeing this auditorium so empty. It's almost scary. <laughs> We're going to continue our series of lessons on God's providence. And of course, the providence of God, simply put, refers how God provides for us. But I have a formal definition for you on the outline. And it says that providence is that continuous agency of God by which he moves the events of the world to fulfill the original design with which he created it. Friends, God is still working today, but he works through a providential way. And when it, because of that, it excludes him working in a miraculous way. And the reason is because we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10, that when that which is perfect is come, speaking about the completed word, then those things that are in part would be done away. Talking about the miraculous, talking about prophecy, the miracles, and the divine knowledge. So God's providential working is done through the natural laws that he has set in place. Now, as creation explains the existence of this universe, and preservation explains its continuance, the providence of God explains the progress of events. Now in Psalm 103, verses 19 through 20, the psalmist said long ago, the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. And once you notice, the psalmist says, his kingdom ruleth over all. God is not idle. Notice also the words found in Daniel chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Daniel said, The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? In the New Testament, we notice the Apostle Paul also mentioning God's providence concerning uh, human will and how he works. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, he says, Who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory. Yes, God works. And then listen to the words of Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. God is alive, and he's still active. He is still working. He is still involved in his creation. Unlike what the deists claim, that God just wound this universe up and just let it go and allows it, is allowing it to just wind down on its own, with absolutely no involvement. The providence of God, we have to understand, does not destroy the will of man. Man is always free to obey God, but he also is free to disobey him if he so chooses. If man obeys God, then he becomes a part of God's great purpose and plan for the triumph of righteousness. If he disobeys, then he's going to have to suffer punishment as a consequence of that disobedience. General providence of God, of course, is over the universe at large. His willingness to allow men to walk in their ways shows that God does not destroy free will in life. But in his providence, God will see that the sincere searcher for truth will have an opportunity to know the will of God. In fact, Jesus clearly said in John 7, verse 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, God's special providence, of course, that is his care for his people who obey him and who follow his commandments. Paul said this in Philippians 4, verse 19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now remember, he's talking to the church here. This evening, we're going to focus upon three main passages of Scripture that deal with God's providence and man's free will. 
And the first one I'm going to look at is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. And I want you to listen to the words of Peter. Now, he is also talking to Christians here. And he says in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning verse 10, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him, let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Peter is arguing here that Christians ought to refrain from all wrongdoing and evil speaking. These words are actually a quote from Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. And those who truly love life and wish to see happy days, they have to refrain their tongue from the utterance of evil things. And the evil to be refrained from includes all perverse speaking and deceit. This evil we must turn away from. In fact, we're to shun it, we're to avoid it, we are to turn aside from every form of evil. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. You see, the Christian is to emulate the Prince of Peace, and we are to seek peace whenever possible. But, you know, we do have to live in a world that is filled with war and strife, and so it makes it very difficult sometimes. But when we do find this peace, we need to hold on to it. And this we can only do, be done through diligent pursuit. But I want you to notice that Jesus assured us of something in the great Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, verse 9, in the Beatitudes, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. There is a blessing that is bestowed upon those who are peacemakers. And the peacemakers are those who actually live in harmony with the will of God. Because, I say that because peace is found only in God. He is the God of peace. And when men learn to live in harmony with God, they learn to make peace with their creator. And Peter said this. He says, the eyes of the Lord are over them. His ears are open unto their prayers. This is something that Solomon said long ago in Proverbs 28, verse 9. He that turneth away his ears from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. So both God and man have a part to play in special providence. God will give blessings to his children, but his children have to be faithful to his will. Many years ago, after telling the story of Esther in great detail, Brother J.W. McGarvey added these comments concerning God's providence. And I want to qu quote what he said. He said, A few days ago I stood in the great fair at Chicago before a weaving machine. A wonder. There were coming out beneath the shuttles bands of silk about as wide as my hand and perhaps a foot long. Four or five coming out at one time at different parts of the loom woven with the most beautiful figures in divers colors. One of them was home sweet home, the words woven by that machine, and above the words was the music. There was woven at the top a beautiful cottage, trees in the yard, bee gums, and children at play. And down below the words and music, a lone man sat, with his face resting on his hand, thinking about that distant home, all coming out of that machine. The shuttles were flying, threads were twisting and dodging about, the machine was rattling, and no human hand on it. Yet, there the song, the pictures, the music were coming out. Did they come out by accident? By an accidental combination of circumstances? I could not, to save my life, tell how it was done. But I saw a pattern hanging up at one side with many holes throughout, and I was told that the pattern was ruling the work of that intricate machinery and leading to that result. I was bound to believe it. Now, you could make me believe that this beautiful piece of work came out of the loom by accident and without any man directing and planning it, just as easily as you could make me believe that this chain of circumstances, of facts, bring about in according with God's faithful promises 
the deliverance of his people was accomplished without him. God was there, my brethren, and just as little as I can believe that all those intricate circumstances in my life and yours which shape and mold and direct and guide us, which take us when we are crude and wicked men and mold and shape us and grow us up until we are ripe and ready to be gathered into the eternal harvest, that it is all, that all this is human or all blind force or accident and there is no hand of God in it. Brother McGarvey said, you can't make me believe that God doesn't have his hand in the circumstances of this world. And it's silly to think that God is just sitting up there in heaven idle and not doing anything concerning his creation. Yes, God's eyes are open. His ears are listening. God still reigns. And he is involved in the affairs of this world. Now let's take our Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at our second passage. This is taken from the great Sermon on the Mount. So these are the words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 24 through 34. Matthew 6, beginning in verse 24. Jesus says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now when Jesus talks about mammon here, he's talking about wealth, the riches and material possessions that we have here on this earth. The Lord says you cannot serve two masters. Both God and mammon cannot be served at the same time because they are opposed to one another. They're opposed to one another in nature, in spirit, and even their demands upon their servants. In fact, one man made this statement he says, anyone who offers God a second place doesn't offer God a place at all. Either God comes first in our lives or he's not going to accept what we give him. He will not accept second place. Now Jesus teaches his servants that we should not be anxious or the King James Version says take no thought concerning our material possessions or wealth. And he specifically mentions that we're not to show undue concern about our food, our drink, or our clothing. Now this does not mean that the Lord is forbearing prudence in these things, that he, he's forbearing the exercise of the wisdom in these worldly things. He's not condemning forethought here. What he's condemning is fear thought. Being worried because we're afraid that God will not supply our needs for us. Now, this attitude of being afraid that God is not going to supply our needs is showing a great distrust in God. And it is described by our Lord here in verse 30 as little faith. Remember, God gave us life. 
and therefore he will supply us with all that we need that is essential to maintain life here on this earth. Now Jesus then gives some illustrations to lead us to put our trust in the providence or the provisions of God. He gives examples of the fowl of the air and how our Heavenly Father feeds them. <clears throat> he talks about the lilies of the field and how they are so beautifully arrayed. And so Jesus' conclusion is, are we not much better than the birds? If God clothes the grass of the field that only lasts for a short time, will he not also clothe us? Therefore, he says, don't be anxious about our necessities. Because our Heavenly Father knows that we have need of this food and this clothing and the other necessities to maintain life. Now the heathen, they anxiously seek after these things because they don't know God. They don't trust God. They don't have faith in God. And if we do the same thing that they do, then we can't, we're not exhibiting any more faith than what the heathen are. So instead of placing the material over the spiritual, Jesus says we are to put the spiritual over the material and then both will be supplied for us. And that's a guarantee from God. Then Jesus gives, I think, the most important point in his lesson in verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So Jesus here sets out an obligation. We must seek. This means that we're going to have to put some, for some effort in this matter. And then he sets forth the objects to be sought. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom would be the church. And to seek the kingdom means to enter into it and to claim the blessings of it. The righteousness would be, I think, referring to his word, his commandments, his law. Righteousness is right doing. And this we do by keeping the commandments of God. Psalm 119, verse 172. And then third, Jesus sets out the divine order. These things, seeking after the church and his word, his law, is to be first in our lives. And then fourth, he gives a conditional blessing. All these things will be added unto you. So Jesus is teaching here, if we will seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, he will throw in extra, and that will be our material needs. The psalmist said in Psalm 103, verse 13, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. There's no doubt, friends, that Jesus teaches that God's providential care, of course, is contingent upon us seeking his kingdom and his righteousness first. If we seek, he provides, and that's a guarantee. Now, for the last passage of scripture I want to look at tonight, it was read in the scripture reading, it's Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now the expressions to them that love God and them who are called according to his purpose is all referring to the same people. It's referring to Christians. And despite our infirmities and our problems that he talked about in verses 26 and 38 of this context, God is able to make all things work together for good in our lives, for the ultimate good. Now Paul here, he is teaching the free agency man, but behind it all and through it all, we have God's oversight of the world. So Christians don't need to be discouraged. We don't need to be dismayed. We don't need to be depressed because of certain things that may happen in our lives. We have obeyed the gospel. We have received the remission of sins. We now have an advocate with the Father. And God will add all of these other blessings that are needed. Now, in this verse here, Paul gives some pretty important information. He sets out a certain announcement. We know. We know that all things work together for good. 
And you know, in an age that has so many doubts and so much skepticism, it is nice to know that there are some certainties. Then he sets out this far-reaching inclusion, and he says, all things, our trials, our blessings, our losses, our gains, the things present, the things to come are all included here. Everything will work together for good if we just allow it to. <clears throat> and then third, he sets out the harmonious design of things, that they all work together. Now, he didn't say that everything that happens to you is good. But God can overrule things and make it work out for, for the good of Christians and also for the advancement of his cause. For example, the persecution of the Christians there in the book of Acts was not good. But it worked out because of that, that the gospel was spread everywhere as a result. We're told there in Acts chapter 8 verse 4 that those persecuted Christians went everywhere preaching the gospel. And the gospel spread like wildfire. Paul's imprisonment was not good. But notice that what he admitted in Philippians chapter 1 verse 12. He said that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Because of such, he was able to preach before rulers and all those in the palace of Caesar as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So God used a prisoner of the empire to be able to preach the gospel to many who would not otherwise have heard. And then the fourth thing I want to notice is that Paul sets out a principle that is restricted to its application here in Romans 8, 28. And that is, it is to them that love God. So Paul is not describing general providence here. He's talking about special providence. The good in this passage doesn't come to all people, but it comes to those who love and obey the Lord. To love God means to keep his commandments. And that's what the Apostle John said in 1 John 5, verse 3. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. So if God created all things for good and wise purposes, we should naturally expect that he will exercise his providence in the working out of his purposes. That he's not going to let things just sit in the hands of humankind, that he is still involved. And since God preserves all things... Psalm 147, verses 1 through 9, we would naturally conclude that he is interested in preserving his people. Since God rules in the affairs of nations, Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 5 through 10, I think we can conclude that he is interested in caring for and protecting those who are in his kingdom. And since God rules in the affairs of families, Jeremiah 31, verse 1, Nothing is too small to escape his power or his care. When we're talking about prayer, that automatically implies providence. I think it would be senseless, needless, for the Christian to pray if we cannot or do not expect God to do something in answer to that prayer. We may not always understand the providence of God. We may not know how he does all of this, but it is always there for the Christian. As Paul said, we walk by faith and not by sight. But also remember this, we are not without obligation when it comes to that special providence. Special providence demands that we be faithful children of God. And remember, the most important blessings there are in this world, they belong to us as Christians. I'm talking about eternal life, the forgiveness of sins, the power of prayer, and the guarantee of necessities. David said long ago in Psalm 37, verse 25, I was young and now I am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God takes care of his own. He provides. He provides the means, and he provides the method of salvation for each and every one of us, for all people of this world. 
The means, of course, is through Jesus Christ. He gave his only begotten son because he loved the world so much. He gave him to die and to offer that perfect sacrifice that we might have the remission of sins. He also gave us the method. He gave us the instructions by which we can be saved. Sometimes we refer to that as the plan of salvation. He told us that we must believe in his son as the only begotten son of God. And we have to truly believe that he is who he claimed to be. We have to confess that faith before men. We have to repent of our sins and then be, be baptized into Christ in order to receive the remission of sins. Then and only then can we have that hope of eternal life. And then we must live faithfully unto death to receive that crown of life. So God has provided the man and he's provided the plan. And now the rest is up to us to obey. And if there's anything that you need to do to make things right, to have a home in heaven, we encourage you tonight, do not tarry. Don't wait another day. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. In fact, James describes our life as a vapor that appears for a little time and then just vanishes away. James chapter 4, verse 14. We don't know when Christ will come. He may come tonight. He may come in the next thousand years. We have no idea. But why would you wait? Why would you procrastinate and toy with your soul if it is not right with God? Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. If there's anything that we can help you with, we encourage you to respond to the invitation this evening while together we stand and sing.